Um, again, my name is Matt Kane. I'm part of a, really an incredible team at Precision Biosciences. Uh, Precision, as many of you know, is a next generation genome editing company. And at Precision, if this clicker will work, ah, there we go. We like to say that we are dedicated to improving life. And I realize that sounds a little bit uh, up in the air and uh, high-minded, but we truly live this. Um, whether it's uh, our efforts to cure genetic disease, overcome certain cancers, or improve our food supplies, we think deeply about the needs of our patients and the needs of the ultimate consumers that are going to need our products. And it's something that's been a guiding light for us, and it's part of the reason we've, we've acted and developed our company um, in, it, by taking a much longer-term view than, than many of, uh, of our peers in the space. And I think that's beginning to really prove itself out. Um, just a quick snapshot on the company itself, a quick overview. Um, uh, again, as I said, I'm part of just an absolutely incredible team. Uh, core team uh, has worked together for really the last 12 years, the first nine of which we independently developed a very unique genome editing platform that we call Arcus. And we did this without any outside financing and while being taken through three separate patent litigation lawsuits, um, which did some incredible things for our team and it gave us the time one needs to truly build a strong foundation from a new technological area. And importantly, it actually gave us real freedom to operate. Um, so today, again, um, we use a platform that we developed at Precision called Arcus. It is homing into nuclease derived, so it's a very unique uh, enzyme system that has nothing to do with CRISPR, nothing to do with CAS, zinc finger, talon, or anything else you've likely heard of in the past. It's fully built at Precision, um, provides us with a number of very unique characteristics, incredibly potent, very, very easy to deliver. It's a single protein, and it has a naturally evolved uh, off switch or safety switch built into the system. Um, it's enabled us to build out our applications in three distinct market areas, the first being cancer immunotherapy, then true in vivo gene therapy, and finally, we have a separate subsidiary that's focused on food applications, and primarily applications in food that are directed towards human health and food insecurity topics. Back quickly to our cancer immunotherapy work. Um, a lot of this work has been propelled through a partnership we formed in 2006 with, uh, uh, which was originally actually Baxalta, and then became Shire. And uh, as many of you watching the news this week, we're not sure who our partner is going to be next week, but in any case, um, this is a this is a uh, program that we are fully running at Precision all the way through fa our Phase One Two A trials, and uh, our first program of which is an allogeneic or donor derived uh, CD19 program that we expect to be in the clinic by the end of this year, and that's in partnership currently with a partner, um, and uh, that's soon to be followed by an independent BCMA program in 2019. Uh, on the gene therapy side, this is arguably where our particular platform uh, has the greatest strategic advantages, and we'll be selecting a lead program to, to focus on by the end of this summer, likely to be either PH1 or hemophilia A. And this is really built upon the back of over, over a year's worth of non-human primate data showing, we believe, for the first time, truly efficient and safe genome editing in a non-human primate model. This data will be uh, published in Nature Biotech sometime around the end of this month. Um, finally, within gene therapy, we are expecting to partner our hepatitis B asset sometime by the end of the second quarter or early third quarter. Talked a little bit about food, so why don't we uh, frame this a little bit differently with a snapshot of our pipeline. I've got a great deal of confidence with the the orange section, the blue section, I'm betting you anything, it will change dramatically over the next year. Um, that being said, we've got some incredible progress that we've made both in large animal models and other relevant um, uh, animal models for the various uh, genetic diseases that we're, uh, we're going to pick from to be our, our lead gene therapy program, and obviously a lot of momentum going into our, our CAR-T programs as well. Our food business is quite different. Then the rest, of our, um, the rest of our organization, this is a very partner-focused business, again, one that is focused heavily on um, uh, uh, human health uh, topics and food insecurity issues, and largely we partnered with uh, major food companies. We recently, of course, announced our deal with Cargill and have several other collaborations that have been formed in the background that we'll be looking forward to sharing more details on in the coming months. So I am already out of time. For our, for our first segment. Uh, the next stage here, I guess, is for Bola to beat me up and uh, ask me a lot of challenging questions. Um, leave a quick snapshot up here of some of the milestones that we've been able to uh, achieve over the last few years and some of the objectives that um, we have for ourselves for, for the rest of this year and early 2019. 
Um, and with that, I'll let the punching begin. <laughs> I'll be kind. Um, so thanks, Matt. Just wanted to start uh, broadly. Um, to what extent do you feel gene editing or genome editing has arrived as a space? Uh, it's here. It's not going anywhere, that's for sure. Um, I think we've discovered uh, over the last few years where some of the near-term limitations are and where some of the near-term opportunities really exist. I think, um, you know, obviously genome editing has been around for a really long time. It's close to 30 years now that people have been attempting to utilize genome editing tools. And of course, uh, it wasn't until the advent of really of CRISPR-Cas that brought so much air into the room and so many more minds thinking about where we should direct these gene editing tools. And obviously, uh, we're now starting to see these tools move into the clinic, largely ex vivo, uh, but some opportunities also in the in vivo gene therapy setting as well. So, I mean, there's no question it's here. I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, I think, though, that the, the true opportunities, the long-term opportunities for gene editing to have a major impact, that, that's a story that's still being told. And, uh, but I, though I expect that we'll see that sharpen up over the next uh, you know, really 12 to 18 months. Right. And so um, much of the audience was probably familiar with CRISPR and zinc finger nuclease, um, and Arcus might be new. So tell us a little bit more about why your technology might have an edge in certain instances. Well, I can, I can tell you a few things about wh where it doesn't have an edge. Uh, maybe I'll start with that. So um, homing into nucleases were really one of the, the first editing platforms that um, uh, this industry tried to develop now going back, again, almost 30 years. Um, but the challenge with these systems and were that they were very hard to, to engineer so that they would go to a new site of your choosing. And that's for a variety of reasons I probably shouldn't get into right now because we'll go way down into the weeds. Um, but even today, even after we've made all these improvements to this system, it is still incredibly difficult to make one of these Arcus nucleases. It takes us a minimum of five weeks to make a single therapeutic candidate for uh, one of our applications. You can contrast that with the dozens, if not hundreds, of CRISPRs you can make in an afternoon, right? But our goal was always very different. It wasn't to make one in an afternoon. It was to eventually make something that we would feel comfortable putting into another person. So safety was always number one for us. And we were really attracted to this particular um, uh, opportunity or this class of enzymes because they have evolved for function in large genomes to actually edit. So they, they essentially uh, find a single site in the genome of a, uh, sorry, in a, in a large genome, in our case, it's a type of algae, and they insert, their, insert themselves essentially into that particular site. What really drew, drew us to this was the fact that these enzymes were being expressed constitutively. They were always turned on, and yet they weren't getting selected against. So that told us they had to be just exquisitely specific, and it's because they actually have an off switch built into it. And that we think, when we start thinking about uh, therapeutic applications, is absolutely critical. In addition to that, these have evolved to, to actually, again, perform this editing function in a large genome, and so it's able to do so incredibly efficiently. And so you have your, your safety and your efficacy right here. So this was a great model for us to work from. The real challenge was how could we send it to a new location? And that took us, frankly, about nine years and close to $20 million to figure out. But we're there now, and I think we're absolutely thrilled to have an opportunity to translate this technology into what would our, uh, we think is some greatly needed opportunities. Great. And so um, there's a lot of talk about editing specificity, flexibility, off-target talks. Um, when will we know more in terms of how your nuclease compares um, and, and, and when the real proof of concept will be relative to other nucleases? Yeah, we, we, frankly, we, we try not to think about how we compare with, with other editing systems. We try to think about what is the problem we're trying to solve and whether or not we can meet the, the parameters that one needs to effectively solve it in a safe manner. Um, and that changes wildly from whether we're editing in canola to in vivo gene therapy in the eye to ex vivo cancer immunotherapy. All those parameters change. And the goal for us is to make sure that we have the right level of editing, the right type of editing, and we're doing so in a safe manner. And that always changes from disease to disease or application to application. Um, but I do think that you, you are going to see uh, some additional stringency placed upon editing companies to ensure the regulators that, in fact, 
they are safe, and in fact, that the, the cure is better than the disease. Um, and that's going to happen. Um, certainly, we're, we're going to be before the NIH RAC in June, and I think we'll have an opportunity to share our story and share the ways that we measure off-targeting and on-targeting. And I think that is going to open some eyes and really push the industry to um, become more stringent and more careful about uh, the way these tools are being used. So I'm intrigued by the sixth sub-bullet. Um, those numbers are either the highest or second highest numbers I've seen uh, in the genome engineering space. So um, could you talk a little bit more about your partner, Shire, and what it might mean if it ends up being Servier? What, what direction, or what are the implications based on what they each do? Yeah, so um, great question, and I, I wish I had some answers. Um, uh, so certainly, again, uh, this partnership was actually formed with the uh, short-lived Baxalta. Um, uh, as some of you may recall, Baxalta was building up an oncology franchise uh, during their, I don't know, six, nine months of, of life. Um, and then uh, post their acquisition uh, by Shire, uh, that strategy has really changed a lot, and that's all been um, publicly discussed. Um, as to what may or may not happen um, if uh, our partnership is transferred to Servier or uh, someone else by Shire, um, I, my expectation is that uh, at least the names that are being discussed have um, a, a heavy emphasis on the oncology space, which we think could be fantastic. Um, but in any case, uh, the way we structured this partnership was such that um, Precision essentially does everything within certain parameters all the way through the phase one, two A. And so, and that includes manufacturing, all the preclinical models, um, everything that one would do to, to get this program into the clinic, into that first data readout. And so near term, we don't expect any, any significant impact on precision. Um, we're gonna do what we're doing regardless of, uh, of who the partner is. And so it's also interesting, you, you're doing ex vivo IO, you're doing uh, in vivo, and you also have a food and plant business as well. Um, which is one of the big differences uh, versus other genome engineering companies. You, you actually have those rights. So could you talk a little bit about that business? Is it um, a subsidiary? Do you have an equity, or will you have an equity stake if you uh, spin it out? Um, how large is that opportunity? Should, is, it, is it an aside or is it an important uh, feature of valuation for Precision Bio? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's, it's really the part of their, our business that I think a lot of people have overlooked. Um, but, you know, again, when we step back and look at, at the potential impact that we can have globally with genome editing, um, it, it's hard for me to see an area that, that isn't a bigger opportunity than food. Um, you know, gene therapy is really cool. It's really exciting. We can do some, potentially do a lot of good for uh, patients that are afflicted with these severe diseases. If you live long enough, we can, probably, uh, we can probably help out in the oncology space if we're successful there, but all of us are eating, and all of us are going to be experiencing some real pressures on our food supply as, uh, as climate change continues to um, uh, you know, um, move around the parameters that one has to have to have a successful growing season and the like. So um, it's, it's not clear to me exactly what the economic opportunities are, but the, you know, all of the markets that we're operating in, these are multi-billion dollar categories, right? We're partnering with the leaders in these spaces, and I think we can certainly make a, a very positive and potentially a very economically interesting application for ourselves in the food areas. And this is a, a wholly owned subsidiary, so we do have the opportunity to spin it off, if that makes sense. But to, um, uh, to my earlier point, all of the different applications that we're focused on here at Precision are, are done with a focus on human health. Um, we're not pursuing uh, areas uh, with the Monsantos of the world where we can improve feed and fuel for, you know, all the, the millions and millions of acres of corn out there. We're looking at applications where we can improve um, the human diet and really secure our food supplies going into the future. Just a quick one. Um, should I be worried about food security? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think we all should be. Um, you know, right now, the banana is under massive threat, right? Um, there's a fungus now spreading throughout Southeast Asia that is wiping out banana fields left and right. In certain parts of our popula of the human population, rely heavily on things like bananas for uh, for survival. That's certainly the case in parts of East Africa. Um, citrus under major threat as well. And this is just the beginning. Um, climate change is obviously speeding up a little faster than we thought. In those implications, there's a lot of unknowns out there. Coffee's becoming harder to grow. These are major commodities. Granted, we don't have to drink coffee every day to survive, but 
I don't know what my morning would be like. So um, uh, definitely, I think this is something that we need to take a lot more seriously than, than most of us are. Because um, again, if we, if we can't eat, we've got big problems. So. And, and what is the market missing most about Precision Bio? Mm. Uh, I think that we exist. We've done a really good job of staying under the radar, even though we've been doing some big and important things. Um, that's going to change this year. Um, I think that, um, the, again, the, the unique characteristics of our editing platform uh, are now starting to really uh, prove themselves out from a translational perspective and uh, leaving us real, just really excited for the rest of this year and, and beyond. Um, look forward to updating many of you um, the latter part of this year and into next year as we start to uh, you know, again, improve our capabilities in the clinic and with uh, some additional partnerships that we hope to have in place. Great. Thanks a lot, Matt.